Ding dong. Oh, you're there. I am here. <laughs> okay, I can be too low. I've only used this software once. We've used it like a million times. Okay. Okay, why can't I can't even like make it a video turn on? This is why we do things with team. Yeah, it was like it won't let me un I can unmute him. Oh, okay. So yeah, that should work. Oh. Oh, it worked. It just turned on your video. Okay, well that's magic. I didn't do anything. I I did it. I pushed the button. <laughs> I pushed the button. I had been spamming the button and it kept saying, You can't do it until I saw a thing that said I was the co host. Okay. This is my show now. Okay, so I don't know if it's gonna it's already recording. All right, well, it's live. Okay, I'll just let him know. That's okay. I'll let John know that. It's live right now. Okay, I won't say anything. <laughs> you can say whatever you want, but just FYI. Yeah, good to know. Let's do a practice mode, so it went right to broadcast. Okay, that's all right. It's all good. I don't need to practice. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> we'll just sit here quietly or mute each other. <laughs> practice is for amateurs. I'm sitting here awkwardly while people come in. <laughs> you could just mouth like you're talking and then they'll think their audio is screwed up. They can hear you saying that, which is great. I know. That's why it's, that's funny. Why it's funny. It's an inside joke that everyone's in on. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marco. Um, we'll just edit it after at the beginning of it, so it's fine. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Bye. That's my tech support now. Nice. I need that. <laughs> Don't we all? I don't know. It's odd. Like normally it um, allows you to not broadcast right away. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'll just ask my questions live then. So when I, I assume at some point there's like a screen share function, right? Yeah. Do you not? Okay. So at the, are you on there's a, a share button. You see the share button? Yes. So you'll press that when it's time. Okay. And then I can pick which app. I'm sh oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And then basically we'll get to see your screen and then I'll probably turn off our faces while you're talking. That way, like, unless you want your face on, that's fine. It's up to you. Uh, that is. So when you do that thinking face, nobody will see it. That thinking face. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, but then you I'm making to... sure that it's actually, oh, um, I don't mind if, if they want to watch, I can do that. I can do it. It's fine. If they want to see me talking, that's fine too. It's up to you. Um, okay, it's just not letting me share my screen now unless I give this access. So let me make sure that's all done before we get going. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if it doesn't work or something, like when I, th so I think I'm doing it, but I'm not, just let me know. No, Otherwise, I will describe you. these slides in vivid detail. All the detail, pardon me. I gotcha. Too bad people can like smell through this video. Really? Yeah, While you're cooking office. something? No, at our office. It smells like garlic a lot. We all had shawarma. Oh. You can smell it from the employee entrance all the I way am, to our uh, office. <laughs> I'm in my kitchen today. I left the office because you do not want the background noise of my office involved in this. I had a talk with our dev team before this. Uh, I give them a 20 minute warning that no yelling is allowed at one starting at one o'clock. Nice. So a bit of shrieking happened and some yelling and some grunting so that we get all their crazy out. Yeah, no, it's good. Get um, It builds character. Mm -hmm. uh, ours is usually the sound of something large crashing behind me when I'm working from there. So, How did your filming of the studio go or the painting of the studio? It is happening this week. So we put up the soundproofing. So that's basically our photo studio that we're going to convert into some video content and some tutorials and explaining because... This, as everyone's about to learn, is a complex subject. That's cool, though. That'll be good that you can do it, like, in-house. Yeah. It's way – I mean, we have the space, and we have most of the equipment. So you don't really need a $40,000 cinema camera to 
film a guy talking in front of a white screen. No, no. So, despite what the ad agencies will tell you. You need this camera. Yeah, they, uh, you really don't need the same equipment they use to film Shape of Water or Avengers to do like YouTube videos. Yeah, it's okay. You can just have a nice little setup. Exactly. Um, I'm gonna reshare the, the link. Cool, so you're recording this. So we'll I live. Am. I'll edit out the beginning. So if anybody is listening right now. Um, this is it. You can't see this conversation ever again. Ever again. Yes, that's it. Just say something really good. <laughs> you're here and that's it. You were there. You had to be there. Be there, be square. It's so odd that it won't let us like broadcast after. But that's okay. I feel like this happened once before. And it just uh, decided, no, nope, you're broadcasting now. Despite mm -hmm. what you want to do. That's fine. I put clothes on for this, so it's fine. Well, that's good. We had a discussion with that in the office today. Not about you wearing clothes. About <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I don't about know what to wear to the office. You have a dress code? No, we don't. That's the. <laughs> oh, is that a problem? No, we really. <laughs> it could be a problem. <laughs> Eventually, it's a problem when um, in our old office we were very like secluded like we were kind of off in the boonies it was great but people would randomly show up and visit <laughs> oh. and so we weren't really dressed for business <laughs> we were like you know you have your investors show up out of the blue oh yeah we don't have that problem they like come visit and i'm like in my bare feet and wearing a tank top and shorts I'm like oh hello <laughs> eh, it's a tech company welcome yeah, it's, yeah it's we're in a that. warehouse so it's um yeah, our office obviously is attached in part of the warehouse. It's all one thing. So it's um, not the kind of place people expect Wall Street level professional dress. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, Ari, you wouldn't have expected that. It was kind of an industrial area. Yeah. But. Our area is very industrial. I, mean, I find it charming, personally. <laughs> I'm going to say we got a couple more people that showed up, which is great. Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. Um, so you just get to hear John and I banter a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to freestyle rap, I think. I think you should. I go by my, uh, yeah, my <laughs> rap name. You can check it out. It's going to drop on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, Poison Ivory. White Chocolate was taken by like 12 other off. rappers. <laughs> um. So we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Yeah, I'm not really going to rap. Sounds too bad. Now you've set expectations. I know. I can hear the collective sigh of disappointment throughout the entire internet right now. Yeah, you should rap um, about Harvard Flying. Yeah. Teach them all about it via rap. Via rap. And it will be like white people rap, which is just iambic pentameter. <laughs> With all due respect to my white rappers out there yeah uh no i am not going to do that uh it's gonna this will today's presentation will be entirely in prose that's very formal it's good yeah. in prose no singing yeah. um, you don't see that word used a lot you, you're gonna use the word prose a lot in your yeah. presentation yeah oh you said you don't you wait no i'm i won't but i should oh okay prose before bros <sighs> Oh, check right. the group. So for anybody just joining us, it's 12.59. So just, uh, we'll wait a few more minutes and let some people um, um, make their way in. So today cool. we're going to be talking all about hardwood flooring with John Dupra from Revel Woods. So hang tight. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Yeah. Um, and then format wise, do you, when I'm done, we'll do a little Q&A kind of yes. thing. Cool. Anything I should know about that? Nope. Um, we'll be gathering questions in the background. So if there's something that's really specific, I'll interrupt you, like if it's relevant in the moment. Um, otherwise, we can do some Q&A at the cool. end and I'll read the questions to you. And Wor works for me? Okay, so you're gonna read the questions, perfect. Yeah, yeah I'll read them too. So you don't I don't have to, have to like scroll through the chat or anything. No, no, I'll make sure that um, we have them being monitored. So cool. I'll make sure that way you can just talk about hardwood flooring. I'm gonna. That's good. Don't talk about something else. No, just complete 180. <laughs> That's, yeah. I'm going to talk about ceramic tile. Yeah, today we're going to talk about windowsills and the evil that lurks within. It's a good Halloween topic. Yeah. Stuff under your sink. The do's and don'ts of daily household maintenance. 
You're giving us lots of webinar topics. Oh yeah. I don't know if anybody wants them. No, the uh, it's like the webinar version of the Island of Misfit Toys. You're so quick with your banter. Like I'm like I'm 10 seconds behind on every practice. <laughs> it's just, I just practice in front of a mirror every morning. You know, I'm just doing that. I'm going to go into the ghetto and I'm going to start a music program. <laughs> I'm going to remind people in the Facebook group. All right. And then uh, we'll get started just a few minutes. I promise I will make, this will be the, the most entertaining webinar you've ever seen about you hardwood. promise? Specifically about hardwood flooring. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I don't want to set the bar too high. Well, gotta set it just high enough. Yeah, this should be good. Hopefully, uh, I'm working from home today. Hopefully, we don't get interrupted. My, I do have a notoriously over friendly mail carrier who likes to ring the doorbell if he thinks I'm home. Oh. I think they are, the mail already came today, though, so it should be in good shape. So, anyway, if you hear my doorbell, I'm sorry. Do you and have any dogs? Nope. Well, then at least that you won't have the dog barking. No dogs. No. As far as I'm aware, I'm the only living thing in this building right now. That's good. As far as you're aware, be careful. <laughs> you, never, you never know. I mean, I guess that's true for everything, right? It's, it's so far as I know. It's far as you don't yeah, know. Can't, no, no absolutes. No. Okay, I think we're going to wait like two more minutes. Just let a few more people sounds join. Good. Then I'm going to go two minutes late, four minutes late. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I so, should be able to do, so I'm hoping that the presentation portion is only going to be about 45 minutes okay. or less, or it's free. Oh, it's free. <laughs> um, no, that's perfect. Yeah. So if you do that, then we'll leave enough time for questions and then we'll be recording everything and sending it out to all the attendees afterwards or any, all the registrants, I should say. So everybody gets a copy and then they can follow up with you afterwards if they have any questions. Yeah. My information is in here and I will... I mean, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm not a hard guy to get a hold of. As long as we, yeah, as long as they can hear, it's in the presentation too. So that way when they watch after, because a lot of people will watch after. Cool. Yeah. Well, then the people to those people, they missed all of this. Yeah. Um. Hey, you don't have to watch the chat. I'll keep an eye on it. Yeah, I don't even see it. No, people fine. are chatting. So I'm you not worried about it. And you just talk about what don't you don't even discuss. tell me. Yeah, I don't want to know. Don't tell you any of the questions. No. Uh, text me if something's going horribly wrong or cut in. <laughs> like if I, all of a sudden you can't hear me separately? or something. Yeah, I'll, just like. I'll tell you. Okay. Make sure that you can. Your, your house is on fire behind you. Turn around. <laughs> turn around right now. Uh, you are not alone in the house. You were wrong about that. A few more people have joined now. Say hello again to the newest people who have joined. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. 103, so we'll give it two minutes and we'll start at 105. 105. Or 10.05. Right. Or wherever you're joining us from. To those of you who are on time, thank you. And uh, I owe you five minutes. <laughs> Don't worry, we usually start just a few minutes after. Just let people get comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so we get some so coffee. To snack. everybody, <laughs> or snacks. <laughs> Um, to everybody joining us today. So there's a Q&A box. So if you have questions, please uh, try to use that Q&A box versus the chat. That way I can make sure that no questions are missed. And um, we're going to be doing a Q&A session after the webinar is done. But if there's something you want to ask during, just please put that in there uh, because we'll be watching them. And then I'll interrupt John and um, ask your questions. And yeah, we make sure everything gets answered. Yes, I will try and answer it, even if you have a question. I mean, I guess if you want to interrupt me, that's fine, but I will um, hopefully get through it all in the end. I mean, we're, this is going to be a pretty brief overview, so there will likely be questions, but uh, we'll do what we can. If you want to interrupt me, that's fine too, whatever works. Well, only if it's like really in the, it makes like sense. Really freshly, yeah. Yeah, otherwise we'll do them at the end, because sometimes they do get answered. Um, right. In the presentation, often they do. Is your house really on fire? Is it looks that way? Please turn around. Yeah, interrupt me for that. Uh, no, I don't mind either way. It's not like a script, so we're fine. Okay. All right. Well, it's 105, so I think that we should get started. Okay. Um, okay. So. So you want me to share here? You're going to do an intro. Um, I'll do a quick intro, and then we'll jump in, and you can do your presentation. Sounds so. Good. 
For everybody joining us today, thank you. My name is Sarah Danielli, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of My Doma Studio. And today I'm being joined by John Dupra from Revel Woods. Say hi, John. Hello. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're going to be talking all about hardwood floor mastery. And John's going to give us a brief intro just on his company and what Rebel Woods does. And then we're going to share screens and he will be doing a presentation for us. And as I mentioned earlier, you may have heard it or not. Please pop your questions into the Q&A box and we'll have a live Q&A after the presentation. So John, take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can see me. And if I'm too loud or whatever, let me know. Uh, so my name is John Dupre. I'm with Rebel Woods. We are a hardwood flooring retailer slash distributor uh, and we're basically we're based out of New York State but we sell all over the United States we are currently not selling in Canada so I'm sorry about that for a story that I would love to tell you someday uh, but don't have time for today so I will um, get a little bit more into my background in the presentation but effectively uh, lifelong hardwood flooring industry and part of our goal in this is we want to reach out and engage the interior design community uh, and have this be something that you can offer as part of your portfolio and as a way, an additional revenue stream. And so we want you as a designer who's working in these spaces to have a better understanding of hardwood flooring specifically. And we can talk about some other flooring types, but hardwood is the most technical, but also the most desired. So anyone who's watching today, thank you. You are uh, taking the right steps in improving your interior design business uh, by at least looking into and understanding this, even if it isn't an active part of your portfolio. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right. It's up to you. You can all right, take the I'm floor. Sure. Cool. Let me, make sure let me make sure this it. is working. Is that working? It is. That looks okay. Good. Can you still see me or just yeah. see the, uh, yep. I can still see you. You can still, you can watch me. You don't have to watch me. It's all good. Okay. Title slide. All right. We got a lot to get through and I'm going to try and get through it all. So this is going to be quick and hard hitting. So everybody grab in. Here we go. All right. So first I want to thank you to Sarah and my Doma and the whole my Doma community. Uh, I am not an interior designer as if I showed you my kitchen behind me, you would, uh, it would be very obvious. But I will say that from what I know of, my Doma is an incredible piece of software. And if you're not using it, you should check it out. You really should. I hear amazing things about it. I've worked with a lot of interior designers and they say really wonderful things about it. So thank you to my Doma for hosting this and Sarah. And uh, I want to make sure that that gets out there. So real quick welcome. today, we're going to cover the basics of hardwood flooring, um, common terms, common lingo. So when you say something like whether you're sourcing it yourself or you're working with someone who is sourcing it, or you're talking to your clients just about it, that the terms and everything you're using is correct. So you sound like you know what you're talking about because that is super important. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the impact look and function of, of flooring within different types of spaces. And then we're going to talk about sourcing because I really do believe as interior designers, you should have a very active role in sourcing these materials. And more often than not, if I asked you about wood flooring, you would probably say, yeah, I mean, we all help select, but I usually hand that off to a contractor or hand that off to whatever. So we're going to talk about um, common sourcing challenges and ways to overcome them. Okay, so a little bit about me. I guess you can see me, so this picture was unnecessary, but uh, personally, I always think if you can just hear my voice, it's nice to see, oh, that's the guy who's talking. Quick story about that. I was at High Point a few weeks ago, and somebody had approached me who'd heard me on uh, Luann Nagara's podcast. I said, oh, you're the foreign guy. And I said, yeah, guilty. And she said, oh, that's, you're not what I thought you would look like. And then, oh, how did you think I would look? She said, I uh, thought your hair would be darker. Uh, yeah, okay, I see that. Uh, so anyway, that's why I threw my picture in there, but you can already see me. So it's good. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, I'll buzz through this. I already said it. I grew up in the hardwood flooring industry. My father was a contractor here in Rochester, New York, um, started right before I was born and kind of stayed through there. Uh, so I grew up kind of helping him with installation, sand and finish, that kind of stuff. So really intimate knowledge of it. Um, I went to a small school west of Buffalo with a degree in marketing communications, trying to get out of the flooring industry. Um, spoiler alert. It did not work. Uh, so I did that, but I you know, worked for a large materials manufacturer for eight years, traveled the country with them. And uh, before joining my father who left contracting, started a wholesale distribution business 
And uh, I joined up with him and that was where we came up with the idea for Revel Woods. So a little bit about Revel Woods I mentioned. Um, we officially launched about a year ago, um, but we conceived it several years ago out of the wholesale business. And it was based on the concept of what does the future of this industry look like? Who is selling it? Who is sourcing it? What does that process look like? It's a very old industry with a very old kind of supply chain that goes, you know, manufacturer, regional distributor, retailer slash contractor, and then maybe the designer at the end there. Um, so our, our thought process was let's scrap all of that, take what we know, and see if we can create a modern way to sell this product. So... The uh, idea was we're really, we understand sourcing. We have connections all over the world with sourcing. Um, we know what is quality. We know what isn't quality. We know where it should be from a pricing standpoint. We are at that wholesale and manufacturer level. So we really had the ability and connections to disrupt that. So we decided to kind of pivot it from originally thought it was going to be more of a consumer tool to better off as a tool for empowerment of the interior design community. Um, and then when I mentioned um, our resources, I just mentioned a little bit that I am in the National Wood Flooring Association. I sit on their Emerging Leaders Council as well as a Retail Steering Committee. My father is on the Subfloor Committee, the uh, Problems, Causes, and Cures Committee, and he's also the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors. So we are very well connected in this industry. So everything you're going to hear today about flooring is coming from uh, the top of our association. Um, none of this is just stuff I made up. Uh, there might be some stuff I made up in there, but I'll be sure to call it out. All right, so let's get started on the nuts and bolts. All right, so I like to start with this picture. This is a picture that I took from a blog that I'm not going to say what it is. So I don't want to be mean, but it was dedicated as an authority in um, wood flooring. And I reached out to them and told them that this was wrong. And looking at it, most people, you're probably not going to be able to spot what's wrong in this but it was a blog post about different types of uh, domestic species. And I'm gonna talk about these two, but uh, the maple and the hickory are flipped. They're, they're not right, though they're, they're supposed to be flipped. And you wouldn't know that from looking at it. But my point in showing this is, if you just saw that blog post and thought, yep, I'm good, uh, you would have bad information. So where you get your information about this topic and whom you're working with is really important. All right, so let's talk about why hardwood flooring. Uh, so hardwood flooring is, if you're doing home renovations, if you're doing an entire space, it is an upsell. Um, you, a lot of entry-level products, which we'll talk about those two, you know, vinyl, WPC, um, those are your kind of baseline, and wood tends to be more expensive. So it is an upsell and requires a little bit of skill to sell. Uh, wood itself, real wood versus those other flooring types, provides enormous value to the space, both in terms of its look, in terms of its warmth, in terms of durability, sustainability, and monetarily. So we'll talk a little bit more about that too, but there is money to be made here in adding the sourcing of the flooring to your portfolio. So advantages of hardwood versus, versus other types. Hardwood has, it's a timeless value, it's hypoallergenic, it's easy to maintain, which is a bit of a, we got kind of a bad knock for that for a while. People think I don't want wood because I have to maintain it a certain way. It's not that hard. I'll get into that in a second. Um, it's going to increase the look and value of the home or building, and it has a look that really just lasts forever. So let's talk about these in depth. So first, value. Uh, flooring can last for hundreds of years, right? I mean, if you ever walked into an old building uh, and grabbed whoever you were with and said, honey, look, it has the original 100-year-old carpets, right? No one's ever said that. Uh, the other thing, too, is it is the only flooring that actually lasts as long or longer than it takes to replace. So trees take a long time to grow. So people think, okay, well, you know, it's not as replenishable, but the more often than not, wood flooring will last longer than it takes for the trees that were cut down to regrow. Uh, it can adapt to any style, right? I've never heard a designer say, oh, this space already has wood in it. I don't know what to do with this. Um, maybe your mileage may vary, but most designers I know usually don't see wood flooring and freak out. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Uh, nothing goes with wood. Um, and then it also has, because of how long it lasts, its lifetime cost ends up being considerably less expensive, um, both environmentally as well as to your client's um, pocketbook. So uh, moving on, it is hypoallergenic. This is a big deal. This was a big deal in my family growing up. My brother, when he was a kid, he seems better about it now, but when he was a kid, he had terrible allergies. He had asthma. He had all kinds of problems. 
um, he had trouble sleeping at night. And what happened with my parents, because my father was a contractor, this was easy for him, took the carpet out of his bedroom, replaced it with, with wood flooring, and all of his respiratory problems went away. Um, it doesn't trap the microorganisms, pesticides, things like that, that other flooring types like carpet does. Um, it's much easier than once it does to just clean because the surface of the wood is not penetratable by these things, so it doesn't harbor them. So it minimizes the collection of dust, mold, animal dander. Um, and then the EPA has actually stated that hardwood flooring will improve your indoor air quality, period. Uh, so we'll move on on that. I'm going to come back to that later. Easy to maintain. So a lot of people I mentioned earlier, they hear wood flooring, oh, it's too hard, I don't wanna maintain it, I don't wanna keep it clean, it's hard to do all this. This is all you have to do to maintain a hardwood floor. Sweep or dust it, that's number one, right? Because what the, most of the wear on wood flooring comes from when you get dirt or grime under your shoes, anything like that, and it wears into it like sandpaper. So you just gotta get that up. Same with vacuuming. Vacuum it with the beater bar turned off, that sounds super obvious. Uh, but you would be amazed how many people get that wrong. Um, you get these little marks on the floor and it's like, yeah, that's for the carpet, right? So make sure the beater bar is turned off. And then the manufacturer of the floor or the flooring professional will recommend a type of cleaning product. That really only needs to be used at most once a month. If you've got a spot on the floor that needs cleaning, really just spot clean it. Anybody who's like power washing their floors every day or every week, it's too much. You're actually going to damage the floor that way. Uh, so anybody that thinks, oh, I got to clean, I got to mop this thing every day. Uh, not only are, do you not have to do that, but you're actually hurting the floor. So that leads to the don't, right? Don't wet mop it. Don't use all purpose cleaner, vinegar. Do not steam them. There are companies that will say steam cleaning your floors. It's the cleanest it'll ever be. Uh, that might be true and you will dramatically decrease the life of the finish on that. Steam cleaning is just completely unnecessary. Um, and then I would be skeptical of anything with the word shine in the name, uh, anything that has like a wax to it. If you put something that's supposed to restore the shine to a floor and it's not something that's actually compatible with that finish, um, you're going to have a really bad time. So that is, you probably have to sand the floor or have it replaced. So I would just be really careful of anything that has like shine in the name as a general rule. If you want to know what to clean it with, though, consult a professional, consult myself, consult uh, the manufacturer if it's a pre-finished floor, and we'll make sure you get the right stuff. All right, so home value. So real estate agents have report, I'm told you, sorry, I know this is going to go fast. I got a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, real estate agents have reported that homes with wood floors sell faster and for more money. Right now in the United States, the home market is crazy. So just about everything is selling really fast and for more money, but it's not always going to be that way. And even in this market, stuff with wood floors sells that much more. And in many cases, up to 10% more for the total value of the home for wood floors. So if you've got a $400,000 house, uh, that 10% is real money when you go to sell it and it's not what you paid for the floor. So you're actually getting that money back uh, and changing your flooring type. You probably didn't pay an extra $40,000 for that floor over whatever you were going to put in there. So we did at the National Wood Flooring Association, we had a survey, consumer survey, to try and see where we were positioned as a floor covering type over other types of uh, flooring. So we asked one of the questions, which type of flooring do you believe helps increase the value of your home the most? And 79% said wood, 13 at tile, and then everything else was at 9%. So this is very real. Um, from a look standpoint, there is no point in recent history where wood flooring wasn't fashionable. I mean, there was a time briefly where uh, baby boomers, whom you know we like to blame for everything as a millennial, uh, were putting carpet over the floors. And I can't tell you, I mean, probably many of you listening now have gone into a home, pulled up the carpet, saw hardwood and did a little dance, right? So it's, uh, we're, that was a mistake and we're undoing that. But very rarely is wood flooring ever not fashionable. So it's always a very safe choice from a design standpoint. Um, another question on that survey, if you could build your dream home, what kind of flooring would you mainly have? 66% said wood. 16 tile, 10% carpet, 7% other. So when you're talking to your clients, this is something that they already want. And like I said to you, there is money there in that if you can upsell them to this. Let's talk about sustainability real quick. So in the 90s, there was this big push when there was a huge deforestation, especially outside of America. Uh, Americans suffered, North America suffered a big deforestation in the last century, the 1800s, so uh, 19th century. 
Um, and that sort of led to, well, cutting down a tree, saving trees, don't cut down trees. I get that. Um, I saw Fern Gully. I get all that. I was a Captain Planet kid when I was little too. Um, here's how it works. Let me tell you how trees, forests are harvested responsibly real quick, just so you understand this. So when they harvest a forest, they don't just go through and cut it down like they're putting a golf course in, unless they're actually putting a golf course in, then they do that. But when they harvest trees for wood, they take a section of the forest, they mark it out. And this is true in the United States and Canada for sure. Uh, and they say, okay, this is what's being cut down this year. Then somebody goes through and they mark every tree of a certain diameter and age. So all the younger trees, smaller trees, they don't get touched. So they mark, these are the trees that are going to be harvested. They go through first. Then they go through and harvest those trees. Then when it's done, they plant and uh, it depends on the average, but it's usually more than one to one. It's usually more than like 1.6 by the time it works out. 1.6 tree is planted for every tree that is harvested. So because of that, then they don't touch that area again for like 20 years or something. So they just let that grow from there. Then next year they move on to the next section and they do it that way. So we've been doing this now for a while, this forestry practice. And as a result, there are more forests today than there were a hundred years ago. Forests are being replenished at a faster rate than they're actually being harvested. And so the other advantage is like a garden, forests need to be maintained. If you just let it go, you get a lot of problems. And that's where a lot of um, these forest fires and things like that, a tree is not immortal. It will get old, it will die, it will dry out, and then you're more likely to have a very significant uh, fire-related problem or insect problem or things like that. So let me talk about, in that vein, the carbon neutrality of wood as a, as a material. So smaller trees, and by the way, this is uh, every picture that I use, I either own or have permission to use, and I couldn't find a really good drawing that illustrated this. So this is uh, my attempt at this to illustrate how carbon is released and absorbed by trees. It is also a really good illustration of why you should hire a professional illustrator, uh, because I cannot draw. So what um, smaller trees actually absorb more carbon dioxide and release more oxygen, much like a teenage human, right? We eat more food. Um, and then larger trees, when they're closer to their fully matured state, absorb considerably less carbon and release less oxygen. So younger trees are better for the environment as a whole than older trees uh, for that exact reason. And then what happens though is the, throughout the tree's life, it absorbs this carbon, it grows, it's all stored in the tree, it's pretty inert, very little carbon ever escapes the tree. Even if it's been cut down and milled into flooring, very little carbon comes out. It just holds it. Where the carbon comes out is when the tree burns, which is why there's so much controversy around biofuels. So when wood burns, all that CO2 is released. So when you have these forests absorbing this carbon and doing all this carbon offsetting, that's a wonderful thing. When they burn down, it has undone all of that. So proper forestry management is huge and taking these trees and using them for things uh, is better from a carbon offsetting standpoint than just letting them die and burn. Uh, so that's a really important point. When you're using wood, it is really the only carbon neutral building material and uh, it's super important uh, to know that. Okay, let's talk about design. That's what you guys are here for, right? So flooring, I mean, it is the foundation of any space. It used to be a very much a commodity item. You would have, okay, I've got my oak and you can, here's the six colors you can pick from and have a nice day. And then you could go nuts on other finishings, furnishings, uh, drapes, window treatments, all that other stuff. Uh, but that is changing as more and more, uh, as the factory finishing technology gets better, flooring is becoming much more of a fashion oriented item, which is why it's something that you guys should be involved in. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. The benefits of sourcing flooring as it relates to your process as designing an entire space. And then we'll talk a little bit about just what to expect from trends and budgets and, and just kind of what to keep in mind for that. Okay, so if you can see this picture, this is just a before and after. And the only real difference in this space is the floor. And just in that, and I guess a freestanding mirror, but the, uh, and that's not, but that's not what's making the difference. So you can see just changing the floor, what an enormous difference it makes on a space, probably more so than any other singular item. And I know I'm biased on that, but I would challenge you to find another item that will change the look of the space as much as the floor. Okay, so as fashion, 
kind of already touched on this foundation of the entire look and function of the space. Um, much like a, a fashion designer coordinates an entire outfit of, around shoes. Not all of them do this, but many do. Um, the same can be said with floor. If you start with the floor as your base and your foundation, uh, it opens up so much more for what you can do with a space. Um, and then like shoes, I like the shoe analogy because they all, it also has to be functional. You can have the prettiest floor in the world, much like the prettiest shoes in the world. But if halfway through the evening, you're carrying them in your hand around the dance floor, the entire look you were going for with that outfit is blown. So similar to flooring, uh, it has to really function along with being beautiful. This picture here was a collaboration we actually did with a shoe designer. Uh, so we did that it was uh, just a fun thing that we'll do. Sometimes we work with other brands outside of flooring and we'll design stuff that's inspired by things that you don't normally see because how much brown wood can one person really take, right? Okay, so when I talked about you guys with the benefits of sourcing flooring, uh, you have more control over the total look and function of your space. I mean, if you don't have access to the canvas, I mean, not every job's gonna involve flooring, but if it does, to give that away to a contractor or to a flooring store and not have your thumbprint on that as a designer uh, is really a missed opportunity because it is, it just has so much. I mean, this space, this picture, is, I think is beautiful. May not be your design style, but I think it was beautiful. And that floor, if you put something else in there, it's going to change that look so much. So it's just going to help um, add your thumbprint to this. And uh, you know, also with the money on there, the commission on large ticket items is it can be substantial. It is a substan potentially substantial amount of money left on the table if you're not involved in this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that too. But the um, other things with designers in general you are, as you're trying to, do, to demonstrate more and more value to these higher end clients, you get higher end clientele, you can do more with your skill sets. Um, it is, th these bigger ticket items do take a little bit more work, but the money is there, the influence is there. And honestly, I'd love to see the $79 Wayfair design fee or whatever touch on something like this. Uh, they just can't do it. It really is gonna set you apart. So in terms of flooring trends, it's a longer life cycle currently than really most other home goods. Um, tile is like five to seven years. Um, I couldn't, I don't want to speak to cabinets, but they're usually about five years. Countertops, same. I think window treatments kind of in that similar five to seven year range. Some might be a little shorter. Flooring is, it tends to be 15 to 20 year trend cycles. So when you're picking something, um, unless you go with something really wild, you're not going to have to worry about it being out of style in, um, in a few years. It's probably going to be right in right now. It's right in line with um, how long the floor is going to last. That's one of the problems with ceramic tile is that it goes out of style before it wears out. And then you've got that. Oh, I don't want to rip it up, but I do kind of have to rip it up. But it feels like such a waste. And now it's sitting in a landfill forever just because I didn't like the way it looked. And that's not the case with flooring. Flooring usually will uh, last right along with the trend. And in some cases, um, some flooring just has never gone out of style. Some wood flooring, I should say. Um, so from a budget, really, it needs to be chosen pretty close to early on in the job. Uh, but because it's, or at least it needs to be budgeted for that. Um, if you're not going to pick the flooring first, you're going to pick it later. You at least want to have the budget set aside for that so that your client doesn't get to the end, has $3 a square foot left. And because they saw some big box store advertising wood flooring thinks it's somehow going to cost that. And then you've spent all this time and all this money designing this beautiful space and you have to skimp on the thing that's going to be there the longest and be the hardest thing to upgrade. So what I usually tell people is, and this is installed, if you put aside $12 a square foot installed for as a placeholder number, you chances are, especially if you're working with us, you're gonna come underneath that. But if that's what your client's expectation is, look, you've got $100,000 for this renovation budget, it's a small space, whatever it is, um, set aside $12 a square foot for, we don't need to pick the flooring yet, we can pick the flooring whenever we want, but um, if we just set that aside, put that in a lockbox, uh, you should be pretty good. You should be able to get most things you want for that number. So that's not set in stone, but I tell people that's a really good placeholder number. And then chances are you're going to come in underneath that and, uh, and look like a hero. So that's what we're all about. Okay. I'm um, looking at the time. I'm doing okay. Uh, structures of hardwood flooring. These are some lingo I feel like we should talk about. So when you are talking to your clients or a contractor or whomever, 
Uh, you sound like you know what you're talking about. So we've got solid, we've got engineered, we've got wood look products. And then I'll talk about the types of finishes and the advantages and disadvantages of an on-site finish versus a factory finish. So solid wood flooring. This is what older people think real flooring is, right? That engineered is more wood look and solid is real. That's not true. They're both real, but solid. So when you say like, I'm looking for real hardwood, um, that means a number of different things, but most people think that's solid. So make sure if you want solid, you say solid. So solid is called that because each piece is one solid piece of flooring. These are not creative names, by the way. Uh, solid, some of the advantages are maximum refinishability, uh, and which is nice. However, you can get engineered that so can be refinished the exact same amount of time. With a solid, you don't refinish all the way through that board. If you see in this picture, you've got a tongue and groove. You can refinish down to where that tongue and groove is that top section is all that can be refinished. Once you hit the nail, that floor's gotta come up. It doesn't matter how much wood is left. Um, so the idea that you can refinish it more than engineered is true in some cases, but you can get engineered flooring where that top layer is the exact same thickness and there, then there is no advantage to the solid. Solids also are more susceptible to movement and moisture, which is why we don't recommend wider plank solids and we don't sell solids in areas with high moisture fluctuation. Um, so that is, or unless you're gonna go much narrower because it really, the whole thing moves like a big sponge. Uh, so that's kind of a major downside to solids, but it used to be all that was available um, due to technology. So on that note, let's talk about engineered. So engineered has multiple layers, usually of different species of wood and they're bound by a, an adhesive. So those in terms of refinishability will vary depending on the thickness of that top layer so uh, you can get some, like I said, that can be refinished as many times. You can get some that are not designed to be refinished at all. Um, so it is, so a lot of times people will mark the quality of engineered by the thickness of that top layer. That's actually not a good idea. And I can get more into that later too, if anyone has a question on that. But engineered flooring is much more dimensionally stable. So it's much less susceptible to movement and moisture, but it is still considered real hardwood. Um, so an engineer floor, solid floor, in terms of real estate value, um, real bona fides, uh, they're exactly the same. So there is no advantage to solid over engineered in that way. And engineered, again, is going to be much more stable. So you can get a lot of your wider plank looks, anything wider than four inch, four and a quarter, or even five inch, uh, is likely to be engineered. Because if you had a solid and anything changed in terms of moisture, if you don't keep that indoor climate perfect, which is really hard to do where I live. Um, you're, it's going to cup, it's going to bow, you're going to have all kinds of problems, whereas engineered is going to resist that. So uh, then you've got wood look products. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this, these, there's always been some wood look product that has risen and fallen in popularity over the years. Laminate, remember Pergo, that was huge for a while. Laminate is different from engineered wood because laminate is a picture of wood with a coating over the top of it and it's not, so what you're seeing on that face layer, much like vinyl or anything else is not real wood. It's a picture of wood. So, and that's the same with luxury vinyl. And it is also the same with uh, like the new WPC, which is a waterproof core. Um, this is a picture. I don't know how well you can see this. This is an LVT that is actually in one of our offices. Uh, we put it down because we wanted to see what that was like and do some testing on it. And I don't know if you can tell, but that pattern, I don't know if you see my little cursor, but this pattern where you see the one knot and then the two smaller knots, that's right here in the middle. And then it's up here again, and it just repeats. And what that does, because you can't, like real wood is, I hate to say like snowflakes because that's also not true, but um, there aren't gonna be two identical pieces. It's just the way plants work, right? So when you try to recreate that look, you can't recreate that variability found in nature because it's infinite. So what ends up happening when you use a wood look product is it looks great in a small sample. If you go to a flooring store and you see vinyl or you see something like that, you know, wow, that looks so convincing. And the larger the space you put it in, the more it's almost a subconscious unsettling feeling because you are not seeing the variation found in nature. You're seeing these repeated patterns. And what happens, it works fine in an office, but if this is your home or your client's home and you're putting a wood look product in there, it's going to, rather than create that sort of peaceful, feeling that you get when you're surrounded by nature, it actually creates a subconscious uh, unsettling feeling over time. And then especially once you see that repeating pattern, 
you'll see it every single time. Um, it's like a stain on a shirt. Like you just can't not see it once you've discovered it. So um, real quick, I'll talk about types of finishes. Um, when you're on site finished, that's your traditional, it goes in unfinished or you're going to refinish the floor where they sand it and then they stain it. Um, the advantages of on site is you can customize the color and sheen. You can mix stains. You can have your contractor or yourself or whomever um, basically make whatever you want. You know, if you want to have a touch more gray, that's fine. Maybe a little brown. Maybe you want it to be bright green. I don't know, whatever you're into, that's cool. Uh, you can do that with a site finish. Um, site finishing, though, is it's time intensive, it's chemical intensive, it's noisy. You got to move everything out of the house. You have to sand it multiple times. Then you have to put multiple coats of finish on there. Um, the floor, it comes in one texture, flat. That's it. So if you've got, even with refinishing, if you've got a textured floor that's wire brushed or hand scraped and you want to refinish that floor, that texturing is going to go away. It's going to be just flat after that because that's the only way you can get that finish off is to sand it. Um, also a significant downside is it introduces a lot of chemicals in the home. Site finish flooring, um, even some of the new water-based greener finishes still have a lot of stuff in there that they don't recommend you keep your pets in the home when it's being refinished. In fact, I've heard some horrible stories. I will not tell you now because they are very disturbing about people who had their floors refinished and did not tell them that their pets were still in the home. Um, so it is doable. It is something that you can do. Um, there are advantages to it, but just be aware that it's, uh, it comes with some trade-offs. So factory finishes used to try and look like site finishes. This has come a long way. So the finish in the factory is an order of magnitude more durable than a site finish. Um, and that is just because of ideal conditions. You can cure it with a giant UV machine. You can do stuff in a factory with perfect repeatable conditions that you can't do on a job site uh, because everybody's home is going to be a little different. And those job site finishes are designed to cure under lots of different uh, situations. So uh, then the other thing with factory finishes, you can get more texture options. You can get hand scraped floors. You can get wire brush floors. A lot of this will add to its durability. So a site finished floor is going to have to be refinished probably after five to seven, maybe 10 years. Um, whereas a factory finished floor, especially if it's a low sheen with a texture, like a lot of the stuff that we sell is designed to go 20, 25, 30 years before it even needs to be looked at. So the idea of I got to buy something that I can refinish multiple times is true if you want something smooth and shiny. Um, but if you're going, that's, it's one of those misnomers that people sort of think, Oh, well, I don't know if I can re if I can't refinish this, um, a lot of our floors are designed not to be refinished and designed to last pretty close to a lifetime. Um, and then another thing with factory finish, usually they're not going to be flat. There's going to be some kind of bevel, which some people really hate that look. I don't mind it. Honestly, I think it looks fine. Um, but that is, it is a requirement for factory finish flooring because of a thing called overwood, which is a really complex thing. I don't have time to get into. So uh, see me after class if you want to learn about overwood. Okay. Let's talk about sourcing. And then I got one more thing and then I'll open it up for questions. So common factors in sourcing, this is what you need to take into account. So you don't make a multi thousand dollar mistake, climate, subfloor, lifestyle. So I put this in here. When you go to Revel Woods, if you're not familiar with us, before you see when you're sourcing for a space, we ask you these questions. So if you're sourcing for a specific client project, we'll ask you the questions and then we'll show you results based on these questions. Um, so everything will work and it will be saved in a unique space for that specific project. So if you've got Johnson kitchen in Omaha or whatever, you tell us, you, we'll ask you the questions and then that space with products that will work for that space is saved um, by itself. And then you can start another space and answer all those questions for that space. Cause it could be different, right? So what do I mean by these climate? So wood is hydroscopic. It will gain and lose moisture until it's at equilibrium with the moisture in the air and each wood species is gonna to react to moisture differently. So what do I mean by that? Well, what works in New Hampshire might not work in Arizona and same with Denver or Miami. So this picture over here is a piece of the Copen Geiger climate rating map. And we, um, that's actually what we cross-reference it with. When you answer our selector, if you give us your, you have to give us a zip code that it's going in and we cross-reference it with this map so we know the climate of the space you're doing. So even if you don't, if you live in Kansas City and you're sourcing for a client in Los Angeles, um, if you use that space, you're going to see what works in Los Angeles, period. Um, so that's climate is super important. Uh, subfloor. Three main types of subfloors you're going to see out there, concrete, plywood, and OSB. 
OSB stands for oriented strand board. That works the same as plywood. Um, so we usually are more worried about whether or not it's concrete. Uh, the other two are considered a wood subfloor. We have to know whether or not it's on or below grade. And then there's other factors. In-floor heating is awesome, but not everything works with in-floor heating. So you don't want to put, if you're spending the money on in-floor heating, then you're spending multiple thousands of dollars on a wood floor and it's not guaranteed or not warranted over that in-floor heating, you are looking at a catastrophic failure that will be on you. So we ask those questions and we make sure if it's going over radiant, this is what you need for radiant so that you're covered, your client's covered, everybody's happy, everybody makes money. No tears, that's the goal here. All right, lifestyle, that's another one. So the uh, Janka hardness, let me tell you a little bit about this. People use Janka hardness as a direct response to whether the floor is going to be durable. That is a huge mistake. Do not do that. Janka hardness, this is what Janka hardness is. They take a one inch in diameter steel ball and then they measure the amount of force it takes to press that steel ball to its di uh, to halfway through. So the radius, I guess, halfway through um, into the wood. And then how much pressure that required, that is what, um, what the number is of Janka hardness. So yes, harder woods can be more durable than softer woods, but that's not the only thing. If, you, if I give you something with a really high Janka rating that has a really shiny surface and it's smooth, that is gonna mark up a lot easier and quicker than something with a lower Janka rating that's textured with a lower sheen. So when you see, if you're sourcing wood, you see that some websites will put the Janka hardness of the species next to it. Do not go off of just that. That's a huge mistake. Um, and then sheen, like I said, and texture also matter into lifestyle. So we ask that and we pair it with the, uh, the right thing. Most people, you know, if you've got a space with high activity, dogs, kids, kids don't really matter as much as dogs, but um, high heels are worn in the space. That's going to require one thing um, versus if it's a quiet bedroom and it's an older couple and they just use it, you know, for reading or something. All right. I'm going to blow through these quickly, but some notes on common wood species. Uh, domestic versus exotic. And then I'm just going to talk about, uh, like I mentioned earlier, oak, maple, hickory, walnut, just a little bit of like what they look like and kind of what they're used for, because I think it's interesting and I'm a nerd and I'm in charge. So you're going to think it's interesting. All right. Quick word on exotics. So exotic, it's just a great word, right? It's, uh, I've got something that's exotic, right? The problem is in sourcing exotics is it gets really questionable. I don't know if you knew this, but illegal timber and wildlife trade is actually greater both in volume as well as uh, dollar amount than drugs. Um, really questionably sourced wood is rampant. So if you're getting something that's not domestically sourced, um, I'm not saying that it's a really good chance it's illegally sourced, but you, it's really, really hard to tell. Um, so stuff that's either pulled off of places where it's not supposed to, or it's not the species that they say it is, uh, or it was stolen, really hard to do once you get outside of North America. Um, another thing too, photoreactivity and toxicity. Huge things with some of the exotic species. Photoreactivity means it will um, darken over time. It'll change as it's exposed to light. So something like Brazilian cherry, which is really cool. It's a good looking species if you like red. Um, when you get it, it will look like this picture of red oak. And then after six months, it's going to look deep red. So just note um, some stuff with exotics. All right. So on the domestic species, red oak, this is your North American standard. Red oak is as American as apple pie and high fructose corn syrup. Um, it has a very prominent grain pattern. It is um, fairly resistant to moisture fluctuations, which is why it's so popular. And it has just a touch of pink hue in it. You wouldn't always see the pink. But if you see it next to white oak, then you can tell which one is red oak usually. Um, so wood nerd fact, red oak is the state tree of New Jersey and the provincial tree of Prince Edward Island, likely making them the only two thing, the only thing those two places have in common. Okay, so white oak. This one is very popular right now. It is similar to red oak in its hardness and moisture fluctuations. Um, not as common in North America, but still very common. You can get North American white oak. Um, all of our white oak is North American. Um, oh, pro tip, if you see European oak, chances overwhelmingly mean that's actually from China. Uh, European oak is a style of oak. It's not always where it's from. If I showed you the numbers on the export of oak from Europe, it is not nearly big enough to cover the amount of flooring sold in the United States labeled European oak. So most of it is um, 
Eastern Russian and, and Chinese. So when you see European oak, it's probably coming from China. Um, so just be aware. And again, nothing wrong with China. I've been there. Uh, I've seen these factories. They invited me out there. But um, just don't think you're, you're getting a floor that's European. Um, that's just a marketing thing. <laughs> Uh, okay, so it is a little more touch gray than more gray than red oak, not quite as pink. It grows all over the world. Um, it's common in Europe and Asia. Red oak is actually an exotic species in those places, believe it or not. Uh, so I will say structurally, this is my wood nerd fact, white oak has a more closed cellular structure, which is why they use it uh, for wine barrels and things like that. They're aged in white oak cast, not red oak because of the closed cellular structure. Um, which is also why it's used in Japanese martial arts weapons. So things you can't live without. All right, hard maple for my Canadian friends. Uh, this one is when you think of maple, like the sugar maple, uh, this is usually what you're thinking of. Um, there are different types of maple and they're not all the same. Silver maple, for example, is very soft, but still considered maple. So make sure you know when you're looking at maple, it's hard maple. Um, it has a much more subtle grain pattern. It's much cleaner. Uh, it doesn't have the same sort of like wood grain look that oak does. Um, and it's actually quite a bit harder, but it's also more susceptible to moisture fluctuations. So a wide plank solid maple will be hard, but it's going to be tricky um, in some places. So hard maple is a source of maple syrup. It also makes a really great set of drums. Uh, I am told it makes a nice violin as well, but as of this presentation, no one in our office plays the violin, so we had to take that one on faith. Um, okay, hickory. This is a great one. Um, hickory is one of the hardest North American species. I mean, it is really hard. It has a high amount of color variation. So you'll see between the heartwood and the sapwood, it has um, really dark and really light tones to it. So you get a ton of variation. It is, however, extremely susceptible to moisture fluctuations. So we, we joke in our office that hickory is like our two-year-old, that even if you have a good one, it's still going to misbehave. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we don't do a lot in solid hickory. We don't recommend it in certain areas. So most hickory is going to be engineered because engineered hickory will behave. Um, but a solid hickory is going to be all over the place. A lot of people will buy it for their lake house or something because they think they see the Jenka hardness. They think it's really hard. It's going to work for them. And it explodes. So they're super unhappy after the fact. So we don't let you make that mistake. Um, so due to its combination of strength, toughness, hardness, and stiffness, which are all different things, trust me, uh, hickory is the preferred wood, not only of random things like wheel spokes, but also awesome things like drumsticks. Two music references in a row. You are welcome. All right, American walnut. Um, I love this. It, it is so beautiful. There is nothing that looks like walnut, but it is one of the softest domestic species out there. Um, it has these rich purple and brown tones. Um, it's expensive. So people put it in really fancy places and uh, you don't want to like ever walk on it or look at it because you'll scratch it. Um, walnut is just, it's awesome if you've got the exact right spot for it, but otherwise uh, I would avoid it <clears throat> for most purposes. Um, walnut, like I said, is both soft and expensive compared to other domestic hardwood species. I always compare it to that vintage sports car your uncle bought after his kids moved out and he only drives it like twice a year. That's your walnut. So, all right. Um, mark of quality. Can you tell quality floor just from looking at it? And then what are the dangers and costs of low quality? And then I'm going to talk about installers and sourcing, and then we're going to be done, I'm prom I promise. Okay, so what are some marks of quality? So wide widths, those are usually quality, but not always. You can get a high quality, narrow width floor, but length. Length is a big one. If you've got something where most, a well, quick word on length, um, um, in America, flooring, wood flooring has varying lengths. So usually, like in our premium line, um, we'll go all the way up to eight feet and it will be up to. So you're gonna get anywhere between, you'll get a couple of one and a half or two foot boards and you're gonna get, uh, majority is gonna be eight feet long. Um, so very rarely will you see something that is just, everything here is four feet. Um, that's very common in China. And it's also a mark of a fake floor because vinyl only comes in one length usually. So um, longer lengths though, uh, the majority being long, long lengths, that's a sign of premium. It's usually more expensive because your yield is lower. So if that's a mark of quality, how does it lay? Is it flat? Does it warp? Is it bent? Does it, did it go together? Well, was it milled properly? If you see all these gaps in it, usually that's a mark of a lower quality floor. So if you see a floor with a bunch of gaps and a bunch of short boards that your friends bragging, she got a deal on, um, she didn't. 
So, and then again, how does it age? How does it hold up over time? You know, a lot of our floors are designed to, as you beat them up and wear them, look better with age, like a, like a fine leather. Um, less expensive floors have some shine to it and they just look cheap and worn over time. So uh, yes, you can tell in many cases quality just from looking. So what is it like when you get something that's low quality? Well, more often than not, the problems in low quality are gonna show up long after the installation's done which means you're gonna get a call back and have to do work on a job that you've already been paid for and are done with. And that's the worst kind of thing for your business. Uh, they're also, when you use a low quality floor, fixing it or upgrading it later is really hard or really expensive. So if you say, look, our budget is shot, we only have a low amount of money for flooring, just get something and put it in. If you get a little bit of money next year, you can't just swap it out like a couch, like you're stuck with that for a long time, or you got to move out and rip it up. You know, it's not something you just fix or upgrade. So it's a really bad idea to skimp there because it just gets so expensive to fix. Also your installation costs. So if you have an installer who's charging X amount of money and you're working with high quality materials, long lengths, wide widths, that goes in really fast. That will go in very easily. And your installer is going to thank you for that. But if you give him something, that he has to fight with and it's, he has to throw away more waste because of the bad boards. When you think you got a deal on that material, um, he's gonna make up for that whatever you saved with that installation cost. It's gonna take him twice as long to do it and it's gonna take more material because you're gonna throw more of it away. So you're really not saving when you do something that's low quality. I mean, I know that sounds like a normal sales pitch that you hear with everything, but it's really true. He'll, you know, if he was going to charge you $3 a foot to install it, you give him something that you got a $2 square foot deal on, he's going to charge you that extra $2 to install it because you've made his life more difficult. More on that in a second. So it's just lower quality, working with a less than reputable source. It's just not worth the risk. You got to get something that's going to be good, something that's going to hold up, and somebody who's going to stand behind it that's going to have your back um, should something, in the rare case that something goes wrong. Okay, so real quick sourcing hurdles. Like I said in the beginning, if I asked you, do you source flooring today? Your likely answer is I make a recommendation, but my contractor or dealer or my customer buys it. Um, should that sale go to you? I argue if you make that recommendation, if you were involved in that, you were the one that sold it. You should be compensated for that. This should be like anything else you mark up. Um, so we have a program that's fairly extensive where we can go into that. I'm not going to pitch all of the ins and outs of that to you now, but if you want to sign up with us, I'm happy to work with you personally as well. Okay, quick word on working with installers and then we're going to wrap up. So when you work with an installer, this is what they're thinking about. A lot of times you think, hey, I'm, I'm specking the floor. Are they going to fight me on this? They might, but this is why. It's important to know why so you can get around that. They get nervous when they hear someone else is sourcing the product, whether it's uh, the customer themselves, the homeowner, or whether it's an interior designer. And the reason for that and this is important, is because they think you're going to pick something based purely on two things, color and price. And if you do that, color and price usually means you got something that looked good enough and you found the best possible deal on it, which means they're going to have to fight with it. It's not going to look good. They're going to be on the hook if the install comes out poorly. Working with bad materials is a nightmare for these people. So when they hear someone is sourcing it, they think those are the two things that went into effect and they get really nervous. That's one of the reasons why with our stuff, we were installers. I've installed our own stuff. Um, when they know that you, because they want to work with you, that's my next point. They want the higher end jobs. They want the work referrals. They don't necessarily care about selling the material. If they know working with you, they get good jobs, good clients, they get paid on time, and they don't have to deal with the selection process, but they know the materials that are being used are good, they're going to be your best friend. They will take, you will get priority on them when you've got something going and you say, hey, I need to uh, install this job. It's whatever, it's a thousand feet. They know it's going to be good materials. They know they're not going to have to, to spend extra time on it. They know that they're going to be able to get in, get out, not go back and forth on which shade or gray they want. Uh, they love that and they will love you for that. So you completely obliterate those objections. Um, and then not all contractors are the same. At Revel Woods, we recommend one of two certifications, usually uh, National Wood Flooring Association, NWFA, or Bona also as a certified craftsman. Um, we can also, if you're uh, one of our pros and you're working with us, I have access to lists of contractors that are vetted um, in extreme ways that are not necessarily public. 
Uh, so I know I did this recently in New Jersey. I have a friend that works for a Finnish manufacturing company. I went in and um, got a list of recommendations of the best people in that area um, that were more of like personal recommendations. So uh, just watch out. There are certification programs for contractors, but uh, they're not all created equal. Um, we can, we help you do that. That's just something that with our connections in the NWFA, we just, we know where they all are all at. So, okay, that's it pretty much for me. Some helpful stuff. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, our website, revelwoods.com. Um, and then we also, there's a link there for professionals, but if you want to go right there, revelwoods.com slash pro dash account, um, that's where you can sign up. We just don't let anybody necessarily in, but if you say you saw us on this, um, we're here, we're working with you. And then uh, we have a dedicated pro email, but I want to give you my email as well. And that's John J O H N dot Dupre D U P R A at revelwoods.com. And that is, um, get a hold of me. If you need something, if it's not even on our site, but you're looking to source something really specific, uh, we do all that. I can find things like you wouldn't believe and uh, can help get you in the right direction. So uh, that is, I went over three minutes over. I tried, sorry, Sarah. Um, thank you. And that is the uh, scripted portion of this, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. That was really good, John. That was super oh, useful. So, so that's um, all the girls. All the girls, yes. All right. Um, okay. Am I back here? All right. Yeah, yeah, supposed, yeah. What are you saying now? You. All right, cool. That's good. Um, I just need to see. I got a handful of questions here. Let me just get organized. I was taking some of them too while we were going through it. I also need to apologize because I didn't realize that I said your last name wrong. Oh, you're fine. It's spelled Dupre. wrong. I said Dupra. <laughs> it is spelled. It is spelled Dupra, and I, it is. Uh, it's a long and boring genealogical story. Of which, actually, there are two two versions of why my name is spelled wrong that I've heard. One is really cool. One is really stupid. I don't know which is true. It's probably the stupid one. Um. Okay. So questions. Here we go. Um, first, do, do, do. I'm going to go through some of the ones and you covered lots of them when we were going through, but I wanted to make sure I wrote some of them down. Cool. Okay. I want to start with that. a tough one. How about, which you talked a lot about sustainability. Mm -hmm. Um, are any of Rebel Woods products FSC certified? No, FSC is a good, that's a great question. Gold star to whoever asked about FSC. It so was, FSC oh, yeah. is, I don't know how to say this politely. Um, it's not what it set out to be originally. Okay. So FSC is the, so, uh, Do I tell them what it stands for? Forest, uh, yeah. So it is a forest stewardship council, I believe. And you can keep yeah. it light. Like if it's, don't worry. Like it, we just yeah, so, the F well. so we looked into FSC. FSC is, it's sort of a weird, sort of a amalgamation of the perfect world and what happens when it gets too bureaucratic. So it is one thing to kind of look for, but they offer, there's so many hoops you have to jump through for FSC that don't actually reflect into sustainability mm -hmm. that it became complete and total pay to play in a lot of ways. And I'm sorry if anyone out there is related with the FSC, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, we decided as experts and where we were at that we could vet our products and our suppliers better than any government organization are. So give you a little bit about what went into why we, why we work with whom we work with. Um, I know the owners of these mills that we source from personally. I've uh, literally text, one of them is, I consider one of my best friends, text her all the time. Um, we, I've been there, we've seen it. It's um, certifications in a lot of ways are easier to beat. So one of the reasons we thought we could do a better job with that, I'm a lot harder to fool. And then we also have standards that are higher than the government certification. For example, there was one supplier, met all of our, our normal criteria, sourced domestically, um, product was high quality, stood behind it. The owner was so awful as a person. I'm not going to say who it is, and I'm not going to mention that, but he fired his own daughter for being, quote, too fat for sales. So just hearing that, and I thought, I don't care if your stuff's the best stuff in the world. I don't care if it's FSC. I don't care about any of that. I will not work with you based on who you are as people, you know? So our standards are in some ways quite a bit higher than even those. So we didn't really bother with the actual certification. If that's important to you, that's cool. We can work with that. But um, we, we just decided we were going to be better at it than they were. So we were just hyper. Again, 
Maybe you don't care if that guy said that, but it mattered to me. So if you're doing business with me, it's going to matter to you, period. No, that's a great answer. I mean, that's perfect. Okay, more questions for you. Um, specifically, so Kat is asking, um, she wants to know more, a little bit more about finishes um, when comparing like water-based and oil. She's seeing oil-based finishes being used more in some of the showroom, flooring showrooms. Um, specifically the durability and the maintenance of flooring with an oil finish. Oh man, that's another webinar. Uh, okay. Short well, version. You know what? Yeah. Do short version. And I think I'm just going to say it. I'll put you on the spot here that I'm sure John wouldn't mind if you have more questions. Um, you can email him and we can also set something further up if people want more like really in depth stuff. So. And email me if you sign up for a pro account, I'll get you my schedule. I'm happy to even jump on the phone with you and we can work through, even if you don't have a project you're sourcing right now and you just want to learn more, I'm happy to just talk with you and, um, and do all that. So um, awesome. short version on finishes though, because I think it is a great question. Um, so technology is moving away from the traditional oil modified and moving more towards water-based finishes. The water-based finish technology has gotten so much better over the years that it's starting to mirror that look of oil. But oil now means two different things. So you have your traditional oil modified polyurethane, which in New York state, you can't buy in quantities larger than a quart, which is always comical to watch somebody do a giant gym floor and they've got just like this mountain of quartz, but that, that's how it works because of VOCs, which is different than toxicity, but again, another webinar. Um, and then now you're seeing more of these things like hard wax oils, like Palmin's Magic Oil or Rubio Monaco. Um, those are different in that they do require more maintenance. You see, that's a very popular look right now. We have some factory finished versions of it on our flooring, so that don't require the same level of maintenance that if you did it on site. Um, but, and then water, like I said, so the water technology is where the finished companies are investing in right now. They know that's the future. They know the VOC laws are gonna get stricter. Um, so they're trying to make the greener finishes look better, last longer, become more durable. Um, and then even within water base, you've got single components, you've got two components. It's, I used to, one of the company I worked for sold finish at one point. So I am very familiar with exactly how this stuff is made and how it's applied. So, um, but effectively, yeah, there are differences. The ones you're probably seeing in the showroom are likely the hard wax oils, like the Rubio's magic oil, Loba makes one. Um, there's, yeah, there's another one that I'm totally blanking on. It doesn't matter. So would you say, I guess so for cat specifically looking to source, should she veer more to the water based or when recommending it? Like if she's in a showroom and she sees something that's finished with an oil based finish, what is the, as a designer, should she say, say, sure client, that's okay. Here's how you need to maintain it. Or should she suggest like, let's just look at some water based and we can get the same kind of look and feel. So that good question that only applies to site finishing. So if you're looking at something that's pre-finished, then, I mean, unless the maintenance, the maintenance is going to be the main difference. So in terms of toxicity or finish or wherewithal, if it's pre-finished, um, it's already inert, it's already safe. There's nothing, you don't really have to worry about that. It'll just come down to maintenance. And then that will depend on the manufacturer specifications. So um, if you're saying this should be finished with a water-based or oil-modified finish, that is if you're, if you're refinishing a floor that's already there, um, then it, it really depends on what you're looking for. But if you've got, again, we don't sell uh, the site finished materials on Revel Woods, but if you've got a question like that or you've got a job like that, reach out to me and I'll, I'll walk you through what to say even though, even though we're not selling you anything. I'm happy to just be that resource. That's fantastic. I'm sure, uh, Kat, you should take him up on that offer. Send him an email. And, yeah, you um, should. Yeah, talk him through, talk him through <laughs> what's going on with the, with the job you're working on. Yeah. Um, got some great comments from... There was a name, Lucy said that really liked the um, analogy just of the shoes, um, picking shoes as fashion and using a statement and, you know, building out the whole outfit. Um, really great that it was something that um, they, she could relate to. And I think a lot of designers could probably really relate to that idea that it's the foundation. And um, so that was really cool. Good. Yeah. I we are a firm believer in it. It is a become a fashion oriented item. Yeah. I mean, you can design every outfit in the world around a pair of work boots if you want, but it's fun if you have some uh, more yeah. options. Um, can you refinish? So we talked a bit about factory finishes and the level of quality that Revel Woods puts out, right? So you said 25 years, somewhere in there is when you're really starting to pro probably look at having to refinish. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens if, unfortunately, 
my client has, you know, sourced something from a big box store and um, can it still be refinished? It depends on what it is. Um, I really, there is no universal. It, some of them can, some of them can't. Um, refinishing is, it's a huge undertaking. I mean, everyone thinks, oh, well, this can just be refinished. It's not a whole lot less work than actually just replacing it. If anything, it actually takes longer. So if you replace it with a prefinished floor, you've ripped it out. Tear out costs aren't terribly high. Installation costs aren't terribly high. I mean, it ends up being kind of a wash. So this idea that you want something you can refinish multiple times is not, it's just an old mindset. Um, more often than so, not, replacing ends up being the same cost and refinishing. I mean, because again, you got you to gotta sand it three times. Then you got to put three coats of finish on it. You have to wait for each coat to dry. I mean, you're talking about a, a week at least. You're I not allowed on the that. floor. Yeah, so. We just redid ours. Um, yeah. Bing house was 30 years old. So it had hit, it's 25 years. So it had hit right at when it should have been refinished. And it was time. And it was a week. It was a mm -hmm. full week. And pets out of the house. And we were out of the house. And we did water-based. Um, but it did take, we, I think we had to, we could come back. But you could smell it a little bit. But it wasn't overly strong. But No, the water-based is going to be lighter on the scent, for sure. There's some again, like the old Swedish or the acid cure finishes where it'll, I mean, I've seen it kill fish. I'm not kidding. It's, it's um, um, yeah. Some of that stuff, but it is the idea that oh well, I, if you, you wear it out, you just refinish it. Like there is this, you don't just refinish it. It's a massive undertaking. And again, I used to work for a sandpaper company, so I was like all about refinishing it, you know. But I'm just telling you from from the inside, the idea that uh, refinishability is somehow adds to its longevity is a is a myth. Depending, it really depends on what you buy and how it wears. Okay, and that so that leads into another two part question. Um, with the pre-finished, I'm going to not, you know, pick on the big box stores, but, you know, presumably yeah, when you're it. paying two ninety five a square foot or five ninety five or whatever you're getting them at now, they lowball so much. What's your recommendation on putting product of that quality, say, in a kitchen or a high traffic area in a home? Because a lot of people want, right, flooring in kitchens and mud rooms, places that are susceptible to water and traffic so you mean like the big box stuff specifically or what? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's a two part question. I'm going to ask okay. you, do you, would you recommend, let me put it this way. Can you put a Rebel Woods product in a high traffic area? And if so, would you also recommend like if someone was buying a big box product, could they do the same? I guess? Uh, so I can, I can definitely speak to Rebel Woods. Uh, yes, it is. Um, we have, if you answer on the selector for that space, that it's a high traffic space, you're only going to see stuff rated for high traffic. Wonderful. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, now commercial spaces are a little different. If you've got a big commercial project, reach out to me directly and we'll, I'll walk you through it. But, um, in terms of our, our selector set up for residential so that you wouldn't need to call me. You're welcome to, but you don't have to. Um, then yes, absolutely. The only places where it can get a little funky, just wood in general, is like maybe in a basement or like right over the concrete in a basement specifically below grade or like maybe in a bathroom or something. Um, but kitchen's fine, mudroom's fine, depending on what it is. You know, I mean, you're gonna wear it, it's gonna wear quicker in the, in the mudroom than it will. But kitchen's totally fine. Yeah, okay. that's, um, in terms of the big box stuff, Depends on what you buy. I mean, your mileage may vary. And yeah. the chances are, even if they tell you it's okay for this, I don't, you know, you, how do you guarantee you know that the person you're dealing with actually knows? You know, big box store salespeople, and I know this is, I've worked for not a big box store, but I've worked several retail jobs in my youth. There's a lot of stuff they're responsible for, you know, so they can't be experts in all of it. They can tell you where to find it, but they may not necessarily be experts in it. And I have a friend of mine um, who bought something from one of the big box stores. And it started to, it was delamming, meaning it was separating um, very quickly. And they did cover it, but even then, like refinishing, just because they'll pay to fix the poor quality does not mean moving out of your house for several days and moving all your stuff into storage is fun. Even if you didn't pay for it, it's still not fun. Exactly. And that's kind of what I was getting at is what we've seen. So my past doing full-time design, you know, I often actually did pick flooring. Um, and came up against this challenge quite a bit where we had to choose to have them not choose the like titanium oxide crappy finish stuff that this was, you know, years ago now. And it was, it was bad and it wore really quickly. And mm -hmm. sometimes I would move into renovations where 
the homes were not, we weren't changing the flooring, but you could see the wear. You could see the wear in the kitchen and they were like, well, I don't really want to change it. But I also don't really want to refinish it. I'm like, well, this is going to look really bad in a couple of years, right? So you just, you know, it's a, the, the quality of finishes that designers pick is a reflection of them. And um, so that's why I was getting at just trying to like say, you know, give them confidence to say, yeah, listen to what John's saying, like budget at $12 a square foot. Don't budget at four ninety five. dollars you know, budget for something a bit better quality if you think that's really gonna, you know, if there actually is a difference, then budget for the $12 and make your clients happier in the long run. Exactly. And that $12 should include installation. So your product wise, you're in the, if you, if you set aside for product delivered at that eight, $9 range, you are, you're going to be able to get something really good. See, that's um, great. Yeah, all the prices on our site are delivered. So when you see them, it's not like, oh, well, then you got to add another $4,000 for shipping. We That's all included. So you can budget right there on the spot. Wow. Um, and then one of the things we do, just I'm going to sell for a second. But the one of the things we do, and because we know we've done enough of this, we on the wholesale side, we've sold thousands and thousands of floors. And we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we developed our own owner's manual. We sell out, we send out a welcome kit with every floor that we sell before it goes out. It'll have a hygrometer, which will read the moisture in the space, just it, in perpetuity, leave it on your kitchen counter and you can always tell if your HVAC is not working. We sell, or we include an owner's manual that we created ourselves. It's Revel Woods, it's a premium. It's something that when your client moves, then you hand in, you know, you, to the next owner, you give all the owner's manuals from like your fridge or your washing machine if you're not taking them with you. Uh, they would be one of those. Say, look, this is a Revel Woods floor. This is a high-end floor. This is how you maintain it. This is the website. And then we also include, just as a nice touch, we include a cleaning kit um, designed for that specific floor. So the second it's installed, your client has the right product to clean it with. There's no questions. That's something that we'll send to whatever address you want um, so that if you want to deliver it yourself or you want to just ship to the client, you can say, look, I work, with, I work only with high-end suppliers and this is part of that boutique experience. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> so I was typing back, answering a, like, a question. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, I think, first of all, I just want to say that's amazing. So you weren't selling there. You're just saying how great your experience, the experience is. And all designers is listening, fine. how important that is. You should really, what, the brands you align yourself is a reflection of you and your design business. And like just hearing that welcome kit, the cleaning, the hydrometer, all of that. Like that's amazing. Um, and so that's, oh, I think some more questions. So um the other, it. the other thing is that um, designers, you can take that as, you know, that's, they can learn from you. I think that's really cool, right? It's all about that experience, right? You're selling something that is of really good quality. You have great experience. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, and then we, we, we will engage with you through the whole process. It's not just the welcome kit. So if you've got a question or you're working or uh, we're developing a feature on our site now where pros can spec the floor and then send the link directly to if the contractor is buying it to the client. But they don't have to go through the selector themselves. The we do like a it's a discounts plus commission, so that you can send the discounted price to someone and say, look, you know, I'm sourcing here. It is if you're buying it themselves, and then it will kick back to your account so that you you get the commission on that. Um, so you can still offer that discount, and it's the only discounts we offer. We don't do like Black Friday specials. We you, if you want a discount on a Revel, it's for you have to buy through a pro period, and you don't pass your whole discount on because I don't believe in that. Just as a business person. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is, and then, but if your installer has a question or what to do with this trim or what, you know, you just put them in touch with us and, or if you wanted to ask the question, we hold your hand through the whole thing. It really is not, uh, here's the site, go, don't call me ever. That's good. That's good. Thank yeah. you. Um, three more questions. So Kat was originally asking about the, um, oil finish. So she was saying that, um, she should have clarified that in the showroom, she's seeing pre-finished oil floors. Yes, um, we have a couple we sell too. Okay, so. It depends on the finish, but ultimately the, the main difference is going to be maintenance. Okay, That's, and what is the, what would you say really quickly, two second answer, what's the main difference between in maintenance for oil versus water base? Uh, so oil will have to be maintained a little more if it's the oil I'm thinking of, then it just has to be re-oiled occasionally, you know, depending on where and depending on how it's, it's wearing. And then the cleaning products themselves, um, if you use the one the cleaning product made for oil on a floor that is an oil, you could damage it and vice versa. Okay. So it really is um, oil. A lot of times I actually like some of the oil for high traffic stuff because it holds up a little better, but you do have to maintain it a little more. But when you re-oil it, it's sort of, especially if it's hand scraped and textured, 
it's beautiful and it just looks better as you beat it up. But when you oil it, it sort of renews it as opposed to, um, it's kind of like a butcher like, block or, you know, when you have a butcher block countertop or a uh, cutting board, same thing. And you have to re-oil idea. them. It brings them yeah, right like back. a really high end leather, you know, yeah, and same just thing. bring it back to life. It. Yeah. It brings it back to life a little better, but you have to, it's designed that you have to do that. Uh, yeah. whereas a traditional pre-finish factory finish, um, you don't have to do that, but it will, it, you know, it just will hold up a little longer, but it, it, you can't like just renew it like that either. So yeah. it's, it's, um, there, there is no one is better than the other. That's purely situational. Um, do you have any opinion on bamboo flooring? I do. I have strong oh, okay. opinion on bamboo. Okay. So here's the deal with bamboo. Uh, all right. This is another webinar. So bamboo benefited enormously in the early 2000s and early 2010s by this mark that it was eco-friendly. And as a plant, it's actually pretty cool, right? So number one, it's not a wood, it's a grass. That's okay. Nothing wrong with grass. Um, but, and it grows very quickly. You don't have to actually, when you harvest the plant, you don't have to um, plant new bamboo. You can cut the stalks and it'll grow back. And it grows in five years as opposed to hardwood, which can take 20 to 60, depending on the species. So all these things, really high marks for bamboo. Here's the ugly side. So bamboo is, you can't get like a wide plank bamboo. So to turn bamboo into flooring, you usually have to cut it into strands. And then it is an enormous amount of glue, like an enormous amount of glue. Bamboo ends up being mostly like the diet soda of the flooring world and that it's mostly marketing and chemicals. So after you take this, you glue it all together. Uh, the glue that's used might be safe. It might not be safe. Most of it is uh, an overwhelming amount of it is manufactured in China where it's just, and I, again, I'm not trying to bash China. I, the, the Chinese government flew me there back in March. I, Sarah, I told you the story where I passed out on the plane. Uh, but the, uh, I've seen the, the standards. I mean, they can make really nice stuff in China, but it is really hard sometimes once it leaves to tell, what was used. So we stay away from bamboo at our company because we just never really know. There's, and we're, okay. we're experts and we can't tell what's in it. Um, and then the other issue then is the majority of the environmental impact of a product is not in how it's sourced or harvested, but actually in its transportation. So when you take something, you have to, you cut it into pieces, you glue it back together like the hot dog flooring now. Um, and then you put it on a diesel powered freighter and push it across the largest ocean in the world. You have mitigated, long since mitigated, uh, any environmental benefit from bamboo. bamboo. Right. And then with the glue, if you go to refinish bamboo, we tell our contractors at the NWFA, um, you need to wear full respirators and everything because you do not know what's in it. And people have gotten very sick from it. So it's um, bamboo is something that sounds really great, but you're better off. Like they said in Denver, they did an environmental study on bamboo. And it was actually greener to use locally sourced concrete than it was to use bamboo. That was <laughs> so it's just, uh, again, can you find responsibly sourced bamboo? Yes. I don't know how to do it. And I do this for a living. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe you know, and if you got it, great, go with it. More power to you. Share the link with me. Um, but I, I don't trust, I just don't trust it. Okay. That's really good. Cause we used to have clients actually that wanted it a lot. Right, right, around that right, because as a plant, Everybody I mean, it's awesome. It. it's awesome. Yeah. And but. the other thing they'll do with it too, just to beat up on bamboo a little more, because I haven't had my fill yet. Um, when it surged in popularity, they actually started clear cutting, which is like the bad type of before. That's where you just cut everything. They were clear cutting old growth wood forests to plant bamboo patches, <laughs> and that was number one, killed it from a carbon sequestration standpoint, and then number two, it caused all these problems because the roots of a hardwood tree are really, they go really deep, right? Cause they're huge. I have one in my front yard and every fall I want to cut it down because of the leaves, but uh, I'm not going to, cause it's too big. But the, uh, the bamboo though is not, it's, it's a totally different kind of environment where it grows in. So all of a sudden that led to massive soil erosion issues. Um, I mean, it was, it really was something that on its surface looked like a beautiful product and was just, it's just when you dig a little deeper, like most things, it just ruins it. Okay, I think we're pretty close. That's pretty much it. I have yeah, a, I have a comment. I know that's okay if everybody's you know listening and enjoying it. And then when we send out the recording, they'll get that many more answers to their questions. There so, you go. 
That's true. We didn't lock uh, the doors. They can leave at any time. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you. You also taught me something. So um, cool. on the moisture fluctuation in maple, which was interesting to know. Like I said, I refinished my own flooring. Well, I didn't refinish them. Had my flooring refinished last year. And maybe my HRV unit is not working properly because you also see, I see the fluctuation, the gaps in the floor come and go. We have, we have wood stove heating, so you get like oh, yeah. a lot. Of, it's very dry, and then it gets really moist. You see the gaps open and close like a lot. Yeah, uh, that is a seasonal thing. In the summer, it probably closes up. Yeah. How wide is the floor? Can I ask? It's two and a quarter. Like yeah, it's, okay. It's that You're going to see that. That's why if that was a wider plank, uh, you'd lose your dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, bigger, yeah, or my child. Something's going down there into the basement. Um, so thank you. That's really cool to learn why. I really enjoyed that. Um, and last but not least, um, if you can just um, say your email or contact info one more time. Yes. So e easiest thing to do if you want to get a hold of me is just sign up for a pro account. The hardest question on there is tax ID because we, you know, we're doing a commission based thing. If we got to pay you, we need that. Uh, but if you, so just go to the website and sign up. But if you want to email me directly, it's my first name, John, J O H N dot Dupre, D U P R A at revelwoods.com. Um, and then, but again, if, if you sign up from the, from the account, you can get a hold of us super easily. And, um, and again, I, I, I do, we want to work with you. We firmly believe interior designers are the, uh, future of our industry. Um, so we want to empower you and both financially and as well as with knowledge. That's awesome. I commend you on wanting to like change and change the industry and empower. Love it. It's tough. Yeah, it's but tough. you're doing great work. Help. So thank you for all of these, this awesome information. Um, as a reminder, we will be sending out the a recording of the webinar afterwards. You can get in contact with John. Otherwise, thanks everybody for attending and for your great questions. All right. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye.